Hello and welcome today to the Euronaval show in which we have behind us the most beautiful of stands, it's Airbus. In particular, this novelty, a maritime patrol aircraft with an Airbus A321. And for that, we have Alexis who will talk to us about it. Hello, Alexis. Hello. This project has been ongoing for several years. We finally see a model. What do we see new above? So we saw a model already at the last Euronaval show. It was a bit different. The trained eye could see that we go from an A320 to an A321. Yes, so bigger. Compared to a classic Airbus A321, it's much flatter. It doesn't show here, but I suppose it's for the possibility of having holds that can open much like on the Atlantic II. I remind you, I was an operator on the Atlantic II. I was in the maritime fear, the Navy, that's my thing. That's a great device. So what's our range? We have the necessary range for maritime patrol missions. We're beyond six hours, eight hours. Well, overall, this is the generation that was succeed the TL2, so we can say it does better. This platform needs to be able to adapt to combat, to the evolution of combat, up until maybe the 2070s. And so for that, uh, we need to have a strong capacity for evolution, and then we also need to be able to adapt to current threats. That's why we proposed a plane that might seem big, but it allows for a large cargo hold in which we can put everything we need for this kind of operation. This allows, as you've noted, compared to the last renovation, there's no carry under the wings. During the last renovation, we considered adding some, but those were only preliminary studies. Okay, so there are still advancements in the design as well. Do we keep all the technologies from that time? Like for example, the Profan has this little antenna at the back, which is actually a magnetic anomaly detector. We recognize the old one from the BAPMAR, what we call a MAD to detect submarines when they are underwater. So we took this technology. There is no current technology that can replace this boom, but like many other functions on the plane, over the decades we can adapt to new systems. And if there is a MAD that does not require a boom, we will put the mail without a boom. Submarines, which are massive metallic objects weighing thousands of tons submerged underwater, disrupt the Earth's magnetic field, making them detectable. Except that the plane itself, there is a bit of metal on board. So we put it around a pole that is in a non-metallic thing and that allows to have a capacity to detect what is underneath. So we will see how it evolves. It's exactly that. So on top, we see that there is connectivity. Yes. A satellite, of course, HF, all you need. So there's an optical ball, but there's no radar. Yes, there is also a radar. Most importantly, in our proposal, uh, we are working with Thales. Uh, there will be radars, the Thales plate radar. Uh, which will allow, uh, with the plates that will be arranged around, uh, to benefit from the latest uh, Thales technology in terms of radar. And there too, it invoices uh, volatilities, since an electronic radar like this allows to adapt to new modes of operation in the future. The translation suggests the existence of electronic scanning radars with active antennas, possibly made of gallium nitride, a compact material that enhances efficiency by emitting less while maintaining a useful return signal, making them less detectable by others. Airbus helicopters are now equipped with the same advanced technology, which is a positive development. So we don't need to have additional protrusions that cause vibrations, etc. So that too is a progress and a novelty of the show, something we didn't know. Maybe we can say it like that. Do we know the number of people who will be on board in terms of crew size? So the size of the crew, it's the Navy that will determine it. So we discussed with her to make proposals. It also depends on the future onboard systems. The timeline is not set or defined as of today. A whole phase of development on the plane is to be carried out, which, uh, if chosen, will start next year. And then it will be time to see all of this, and especially everything concerning the crew. Know that there is another option for now. The DGN has not chosen between Airbus and Dassault. Presumably, Airbus is still a plane that has a low operating cost and more size on board. From the information I have for now, they are off to a good start. We'll see next year. We don't know anything. Ah, well, we'll see then. For me at the time, it was also a plane with the Atlantic II. We were descending to 100 feet, 30 meters. It's going to be done with a jet plane. It can be done. He needs a bit. The flight laws we did uh, went tunnel tests with a simulator with former ATL two pilots. And in fact, we managed to descend uh, to fly low and slow, low and slow, as we say. Then will the concept of employment of the ATLs 
tomorrow's uh, maritime patrol aircraft require to fly as low. That's our business. It depends on the National Navy, but a priori, provided that we finish the development and then we make the plane. It's possible. In any case, we are confident. Regardless, the United States has already implemented this change. They had the P-3C, which was a turboprop plane. They switched to the P-8, which is also a jet plane. So this evolution, it's logical. It happens everywhere in the world in all cases. In terms of sensors, I'm still going to do a little focus. We can well imagine that there will be electronic warfare systems. We can imagine this plane will be well protected with flare launchers, laser detectors, and other defensive systems. In any case, we can see that it's a beautiful machine and the small infrared camera that is here. The choices are not final, but in any case, we're expecting it soon. What are the implementation deadlines we hope? Uh, so we need to meet the needs of a marine and it's before 2035, around the year 2035. So that, that remains to be definitively said, but she must already choose between the two before that. Okay, let's continue. We're getting to the Euro drone that we've been talking about for quite some time. For me, the Euro drone was a drone, rather an aerial terrestrial drone. That's why we see some weapons oriented more towards the ground. So what is it going to do over the sea? Well, it has its own capabilities that give it an ability to do maritime science that is quite exceptional, I think. That is to say, there are onboard radars that would be dedicated to naval aviation. Uh, in the nose, there are radars that have sea detection characteristics, which we can still adapt, which offer uh, not a 360 degree coverage, but which we can move to put underneath, under the belly, to have a 360 degree coverage. Of course, there is the automatic identification system, which allows to query the buildings uh, that are on the water. In terms of employment, the aircraft's own capabilities with its two engines allow it to travel far in air navigation, far from the coast, without being far from a base. So that's very valuable for countries that have vast oceanic expanses to monitor. Japan joined the project due to their strong interests. They're all the Kuril Islands, and they have a very important issue with monitoring these areas. And that, of course, can meet their needs. And then they start to have characteristics that in the end are not as detestable as what I was saying in previous videos. It's possible I'll end up there, but it's not certain yet. I think it will be a nice plane. It needs to be built. But for marine science, undoubtedly, it will be interesting. And incidentally, we should not make the Euro drone or other smaller drones. It must be done. We are now arriving at H160. Where do we have H160? So for H160, we continue to develop. Today, all the military systems that are present on this model have been integrated into a demonstrator to perform all the aerodynamic checks, the verification of the aircraft's behavior. This also includes jet deflectors to reduce the infrared signature. And all of this, it flew in Marignane. And we are assembling the first prototype of the H160-1000, which will make its first flight next year in the Army version. The H-174 yards, based on a proven civil helicopter, has been validated a million times. Lower operating costs, we adapt it, we put everything necessary on board. Remember, we can add pods on the top and sides, so it's an ultra-modular device. There you have it, completely modular to cover all missions, from rescue, troop transport, surveillance and attack, ground attack, maritime attack, depending on the needs. We won't tour the cockpit, as we've already made a video of it. I refer you to the previous video in which we had gone to see the H160. However, we saw the VSR two years ago. I see that there are some additional small modulations. Absolutely. So today at Euronaval, what we're presenting is a concept of anti-submarine warfare and modular warfare. That is to say, starting from the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance version that we know with a radar and an optical ball, we are presenting here anti-submarine pods developed with our partners, Thales, Naval Group, CAE and Aresia with a carrying capacity of Son of Lash type buoy and anti-submarine grenade attack charge that allows all this emission. The buoy equipped with a sonar unfolds and falls into the water. A small antenna on top enables maritime patrols to monitor underwater activities. Golden ears which you may think are only found in submarines are also present in airplanes. And this, this is an anti-submarine charge. It's not the Moray eel yet. No, it's an anti-submarine grenade that allows, as we had in the Second World War, but which remains very effective against small submarines. We also integrate a new generation magnetic anomaly detector to confirm the presence of the metallic submarine underwater. All of this is integrated into the pod. And we see that it's ultra miniaturized. Absolutely, but this is the version that exists. In my time, it was 40 cube. And there you go, it makes a 0.8. I drew a 0.8. 
kg one kilogram eight it already flies on helicopter as well in the united states the french the french have tested it they have tested it on their nfh so they did a test it's something that is very very efficient and so we aim to integrate it on the vsr and maybe in the future also on the h161000 that's the goal so we validated the mud on the nh190 the navy the french did a test we need to check with them on waiting we're waiting to see in a few weeks maybe a few years they conducted a test 1.8 kg it would be a shame to do without it because at the time it was still a very large payload behind you i see two drones well there are some columns around but we're still going to go so these are smaller drones we're at 16 kg for the aliaka the aliaka is a device made in france in pierre latte a purely french company which is in service in the french navy on boats that do not have a helicopter platform because it is launched with a catapult it is recovered in a net all this is installed in less than a quarter of an hour on the boat and it allows to fly for three hours with a camera that provides information to the boat france which operates on these boats has bought a certain amount because they are very happy with them excellent let's see the flex rotor it's the latest an integration uh, absolutely flex roto has been an airbus company since may it's an american company that manufactures this product which already has over 4,000 hours of flight in operation both in afghanistan and in the arabian gulf seas that persian which also carries out fire surveillance missions in the united states so it's a product that weighs 25 kilograms that carries eight kilograms of payload and is capable of flying with this load for 14 hours it takes off vertically without assistance automatically. Then it transitions to fly like a flat plane and it comes back to land vertically. It is capable of landing in a four meter by four meter area up to platform movements of six degrees without any problem. It can take off from a helicopter carrier, for instance. It can take off from a helicopter carrier or a mine hunter without needing a helicopter platform. It can take off from a truck. It can also be used for ground operations. So what are the small sensors that we have at the end? So these are not sensors. These are propellers that allow to control the yaw axis when we are in vertical flight mode. And so it allows to control the device. Maneuverability and winds up to 27 knots from any direction thanks to this system. And what we also see is that instead of having two blades like many systems, it only has one. Why? Because when we are in forward flight, the drag is greatly reduced and therefore the performance is much better. Excellent. Listen, how you see friends. Uh, at Airbus, it innovates there are in all areas, whether it flies high, low, at the bottom of the water, with reactors, everything on all fronts. With crews or without crews, we are present on all fronts. Come on, a big thank you. Thank you.